So as the title of paper of the paper suggests, we look at whether carbon risk is priced in the cross-sectional corporate bond return. So the um, so big picture motivation is that climate change is already having a significant economic and societal impact. So many studies, especially in the economic uh, literature, have already documented that climate change can affect a very wide range of economic and social outcome, including uh, macro level GDP growth or labor productivity, and uh, um, also firm profits. So the scientific consensus is that climate change is mostly caused by accumulation of greenhouse gas. So any regulation that should uh, try to solve the climate change issue should uh, target at significantly curbing firms carbon emission through some uh, both price or quantity combined uh, approach such as carbon tax or cap trade program. So we already see many, some uh, countries start to impose or some parts of the country start to impose carbon tax. And also there are uh, new carbon uh, trade markets are being established. Um, so for example, in recent uh, uh, August, uh, China established national carbon market uh, and also allow the firms to trade their carbon allowance. So we will see more and more this type of uh, government regulation imposed on carbon intensive firms. So according to uh, some estimates, uh, if we are going to, uh, so if we are going to generate, if we are going to burn off non fossil fuel reserves, that's going to generate around uh, 2,800 billion tons of carbon emission. Well, if we are going to keep the temperature below two degrees Celsius set by the Paris Agreement, or even 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a new uh, limit, uh, then only one fifth of that carbon budget can be utilized. So that creates a so-called stranded asset issue. So which means that uh, uh, many of the reserves on the oil and the gas companies uh, cannot be utilized. And so their market valuation should be significantly discounted if, uh, if this uh, climate regulation become more stringent in the future. So naturally, we would think about more stringent government regulation should have heterogeneous effects across different firms in the economy. And uh, it's intuitive to think that the effects will be most relevant for carbon intensive firms. So first the reason could be that regulation uh, will impose a carbon tax or some type of carbon trade system as that can increase the operating cost of uh, many firms that are highly carbon intensive, uh, has a have very high carbon intensive business model. And also uh, another reason could be the, through the financing channel. So there is a, a gradual uh, climate related uh, uh, financial market trends. So there are more funds that, that establish or adopt a, a sustainable investing principle. And so the trend toward the sustainable investing can increase the cost of financing for a high carbon intensive firm. So that will also reduce the, firm, the value of such a firm in the future. And uh, more stringent climate policy are also likely to be proposed and implemented when the global climate worsens unexpectedly. So this is likely to be true in uh, any democratic co countries where you need a large su support of the voters to uh, propose more stringent climate policy. And it's more likely to happen when people feel the climate change is real. So that's when there are more natural disasters, for example, or more storms and uh, uh, hurricanes. So it's more easy for government to propose more stringent climate policy in such periods. So what this suggests is that uh, the climate policy are more likely to become more stringent in a state of world when climate uh, already impose a negative externality on investor welfare. So that's uh, according to traditional asset pricing theory, suggests that a climate risk or carbon risk is a systematic risk factor and should be already or should be priced in a rational uh, markets. So that's a, a carbon risk premium hypothesis, which is our now hypothesis. That is the investor demand a high expiry return for holding securities issued by carbon intensive firm. So we take this idea and then examine whether there is indeed a carbon risk premium in the US corporate bond market. 
So the natural question is why we look at the corporate bond market, the fixed income market, instead of the equity market. So the, there are several reasons. One important reason is that, uh, so, so far we talked about the more stringent government regulation, now or future, and these are more likely to be downside risk to firm value. And then we know from Merton models that uh, the debt is equivalent to a short put option on firm's asset plus a risk response. So it's naturally more sensitive to the downside risk of the, uh, than the equity market. Uh, if you look at the payoff structure of the equity, it's uh, similar to a co-option co on firm's asset. So compared to equity, that is naturally more sensitive to downside risk. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is uh, more ready to invest clientele. So we know that uh, fixed income is mainly an institutional market. So corporate bonds are mainly held by institutional investors and uh, they are more sophisticated uh, and likely already take carbon risk into account. So indeed, uh, there's a survey paper by Kruger, Sorting and Stocks. They survey a large group of institutional investors and find that uh, more than half of the institutional investors believe the regulatory risk of climate change is already materializing, although physical risk may still be far away. And uh, indeed, we are exactly looking at the regulatory risk of climate change. And uh, given the nature of the corporate bond market, we believe that if there is a pricing effect in the financial market, corporate bond market should be the place where we should find a significant pricing effect. And also there are significant heterogeneity in important uh, bond characteristics. So two most important characteristics are credit rating and the maturity. So this allows us to test underlying channels of the pricing or mispricing of carbon risk. And lastly, corporate bond is a very important market and there are some fragility issues in the corporate bond market as emphasized by, by previous study. And also as we see in the, the recent, uh, the turmoil in the COVID-19, there's a sell off in the bond market, including treasury bond market that caused a lot of trouble to the financial market. So naturally the bond market is a uh, quite a fragile market and usually can destabilize the financial market more easily than the equity market. So if the carbon risk is not fully priced in by the fixed income market, then this may pose a financial stability concern to regulators in the world. So um, to examine this question, we first gather the data from true cost on firm level carbon emission. And we, our main measure of firm carbon risk is a intensity measure. So it's carbon intensity, which is a tons of CO2 equivalent emissions scaled by firm's total revenue. And then we relate to this, uh, the, this carbon intensity measure at the firm level to the cross-sectional corporate bond return issued by these firms. And we find evidence actually contrary to the carbon risk premium hypothesis. So what we find is that the bonds issued by higher carbon intensity firm are indeed riskier as measured by higher bond market beta, higher downside risk, lower credit rating, and the lower liquidity. However, despite the high risk of the bonds issued by carbon intensity firm, we find these bonds actually underperform by around uh, 2% per year relative to low carbon intensity bonds. And uh, um, so, so we call this a low carbon alpha because it's the bond issued by low carbon intensity firm uh, outperform the bond issued by high carbon intensity firm. So this low carbon alpha actually persists after we adjust for other risk exposure and uh, also control for a comprehensive list of bond characteristics using pharma my best the multivariate regression approach. So given uh, the now hypothesis is rejected and we find evidence actually contrary to the carbon risk premium hypothesis in the data. So what other theories can explain the or rationalize the low carbon alpha? So there are two recent uh, theoretical studies that can potentially explain the low carbon alpha. So um, the first hypothesis is uh, put forward by Pastor Stallman Taylor. So they argue that uh, in Caribbean, the green assets should able to earn lower return because they are better hedge against climate change. And also uh, if investors do prefer green assets, then it will lower the discount rate of such assets. However, they also predict that uh, during the transition process, uh, 
from uh the from the usual the, the past uh, investing equipment to the new investing equipment when more and more investors adopt uh, uh ESG investing approach the green assets can actually outperform the brown assets this is simply an investor demand or investor preference story so if more and more investors start to buy green assets they are collective demand will push up the price of green assets and uh, also push down the price of brown assets. So if you compute the real life return over this period, when investor, more and more investor uh, start to divest from carbon intensive firm, uh, we can, we will, you will find that the green assets actually earn higher return than brown assets. So we test this idea and uh, uh, we have two sets of evidence uh, about this uh, hypothesis. First, we found that indeed the institution invest actually work their talk. So they divest from the bond issued by a carbon intensive firm. Um, so they do uh, collectively reduce their holding on bonds issued by a high carbon intensity firm. However, you find that this uh, demand preference, demand change or preference change or by institution investor uh, cannot fully explain the shift in the, sorry, cannot fully explain the low carbon alpha. So it can affirm around like 25% of low carbon alpha, but remaining part of the carbon alpha, low carbon alpha is still significant and cannot be fully explained by the change in investor demand. So uh, we then test the second hypothesis that can also explain why uh, low carbon intensity firm or low carbon intensity assets actually earn high return. So this is a theoretical paper by uh, Patterson and his co-authors. So they argue that uh, green assets can actually earn high re return if being carbon efficient uh, indicates a strong firm fundamental and the market actually underreact to this credibility of fundamental. So essentially this is a behavioral story, carbon intensity or some form of uh, uh, ESG score is actually predict a firm's fundamental performance and the market underlook or underreact to this uh, credibility. And that can lead to uh, significant uh, low carbon alpha in the data. So our evidence is most consistent with this under rationing hypothesis. So we find that, for example, carbon intensity indeed can predict a lower future firm cash flow news and the deteriorated bond credit worthiness and also more frequent environmental incidents. And we also find that the cross-sectionally, um, the low carbon alpha is stronger among bonds with high information asymmetry. Uh, and this is uh, the place where investor might underreact most to the credibility of carbon intensity for firm value. So um, overall, our paper contribute to the, the growing climate finance literature. So there are two types of climate risk that are distinguished by the previous studies. So one type of risk is a physical risk. And this is a risk that uh, result from adverse effect of climate change on economic activity such as extreme weather events, sea level rise. So I, I also have a paper with uh, uh, Harrison and the Zhang Ning on this, on this area. So in that paper, we find that uh, global agriculture and the food companies underwear to drought risk, which are intensified by climate change. And they also paper look at uh, the climate, the physical risk, especially sea level rise risk, whether it's priced in the real estate market in the municipal bond market and also in the sovereign bond market. Um, this paper is different. We look at the regulatory or transition risk of climate change. So carbon dioxide or carbon emission itself uh, inflict no harm on firms fundamental value. It's only the expected cost imposed on the firm from policies or regulations that are going to implement that to cli combat climate change and a transit toward the low carbon economy that will affect the firm value negatively. So uh, there are also some paper look at uh, the pricing of carbon risk uh, in other asset class. Um, for example, Ihan Sotin and Vilkov, they look at that uh, whether the climate, uh, whether the carbon risk is priced in the option market and they find evidence that uh, it seems that the output of money option indeed uh, uh, take into account the higher climate risk, uh, climate policy uncertainty in the implied by the high carbon intensity firm. And also uh, Bolton and Kastrzak look at whether the level of carbon emission uh, 
and also the growth of carbon emission affect cross-section of corporate stock return in the US and the, uh, in the global context. And they find evidence that it seems that a carbon emission level uh, is priced in the stock market. And then we will talk more, I will talk more about the difference of our paper with their results uh, later. Uh, and their paper look at the firm's uh, toxic emission intensity and whether it is priced by the stock market. Um, we also contribute to the broader literature on how firms ESG characteristic relate to stock performance. And again, there are conflicting evidence uh, on this uh, area. So some people find that invest indeed demand the highest fair return for holding stocks with poor ESG characteristics in uh, a variety of contexts. Uh, but some study also find that uh, high ESG score is not fully recognized by the market. So if a firm performs better on some dimension of uh, ESG, uh, it will predict a higher future stock return. Um, and lastly, our paper also contributed to the cross-sectional determinants of corporate bond return. So the past li prior literature mainly emphasized uh, bond characteristics, including illiquidity uh, and also uh, uh, risk exposure of corporate bond, such as default term risk, downside risk, liquidity risk, or uncertainty risk. And we contribute to this uh, literature by studying a new dimensional risk, uh, which is a uh, carbon risk. So our data for corporate bond uh, return is from the enhanced version of the trace. So trace mainly contains the secondary market transaction data. And uh, in order to get the bond characteristics, we merge the bond pricing data with the merging to obtain bond characteristics such as offering amount, maturity date, and the coupon rate. And uh, um, the, we adopt the filtering criteria proposed by, by Bali and the Wen. And uh, we also calculate, we calculate the daily clean price as the volume which average of intraday price to minimize the impact of beta spread. So to calculate a bond return, uh, the formula to calculate bond return is actually quite similar to stock return. So it's mainly the change of the price of the bond plus uh, some type of cash flow. So for bond, the true price of the bond is actually the transaction price, which is P plus accrued interest. So this whole part the P plus AI accrued interest is called dirty price, which is the true price of the bond. And uh, uh, we also need to add back the cash flow of the, the bond invest received, which is a coupon. So this is uh, similar to the for stop, similar to the stock, stock return, which is a stock price plus uh, some type of dividend. And then we scale divided by the, the price in the last month of the bond, which is uh, the denominator. And that's the total return of the bond. So um, after we getting the bond pricing data, we merge with the true cost, which contains the firm level carbon emission data. So our final sample includes uh, more than 20,000 bonds because one firm usually issue multiple bonds. So we have more than 20,000 bonds issued by around 1,100 unique firm. And our sample period is from July 2006 to June 2019. This is mainly constrained by the availability of the carbon emission data. So the true cost first uh, pro report the carbon firm level carbon emission data uh, starting from the physical year 2005. And in order to study whether it predicts a future return. So we follow the traditional pharma French approach, starting the return calculation of the in the six months after the physical year end of the, the 2005. So um, the firm level carbon emission data is from S&P True Cost. So True Cost is a leading company data vendor that provide the accurate firm level carbon emission data. And also, of course, other environmental related data. And uh, um, according to Greenhouse Gas Protocol, there are three scope of carbon emission. The scope one is the uh, emission from the source controlled directly by the firm. So if a firm like uh, owns a plants and the plants in the production process generates carbon emission, that will include in the scope one emission of the firm. Scope two emission includes the emission generated from purchased energy. So if a firm purchases electricity from a utility provider, so um, the carbon 
emission from generating that electricity will be counted as scope two emission of the firm. And the scope three is a broader definition of carbon emission and includes all the carbon emission that are generated along the entire value chain. So if a firm purchases a raw material from a supplier and when the supplier produces that raw material for the customer, the carbon emission generated from producing that raw material will be counted as scope three. And there are also downstream activities that are, can be, uh, that can generate the carbon dioxide and also be counted as scope three. Um, so things like uh, uh, product use, waste disposal, or employee commute, these all can generate, all these activity can generate a carbon emission. And although the firm that does not directly control the source that generated the carbon emission, uh, it's ultimately related to their downstream activity. So it will be counted as scope three. So in our main test, we will use scope one and also scope two because um, the, the true cost uh, provides these two types of, uh, especially scope one data, more com comprehensively, especially in the early sample period. While scope three, they only start to widely report the data starting from uh, 2015. And another issue is that uh, scope one is usually uh, reported by the firm, uh, while scope three uh, is actually, so in the true cost, uh, it's actually estimated by the true cost using some input output model. So it's not actually the carbon emission reported by the firm. So that's why in our analysis, we focus mainly on scope one and also scope two. Um, so this is uh, our main measure of carbon risk measure is the carbon intensity, which is a, a standard metric to measuring carbon footprint used by both academia and also by practitioners. So carbon intensity is actually the level of carbon emission, which is measured in tons of CO2 equivalent scaled by some type of firm size. So you can, we, we scale it by the revenue of the firm, but uh, uh, it does not uh, matter too much if you scale it by uh, firm's total assets, for example. So as long as you perform some skill, it will become an intensity measure. So this measure is also used by, for example, by MSCI to construct their low carbon index. And we believe that this carbon intensity is the correct measure of firm's carbon risk exposure because uh, our goal is to examine how this carbon risk uh, exposure affect the stock return or bond return. So then it should be evaluated relative to firm size. So if I uh, consider two firms, one is a firm that is a very large, generate a lot of uh, maybe one billion dollars of revenue. Another firm only generate one uh, millions of revenues. Um, so if both firms are required to cut uh, maybe for example, one ton of carbon emission, then the cost will be, percentage cost, will be much higher for the small firm compared to the big firm. So the impact on the stock return or the bond return will also be larger for the small firm. So that's why we believe that when the goal is to examine um, how the expected government uh, regulation is going to impact the firm value in terms of percentage, in, not in terms of dollar, then uh, we should uh, perform some type of scaling uh, in order to make the different firm comparable. Um, so that's uh, our choice, our motivation to use an intensity measure rather than using the level to measure the carbon, carbon risk. And Frank, uh, Frank, excuse me, tiny question on this slide. <clears throat> I see the upper line is dropping off very sharply. Yes, that's a very good uh, uh, observation, Julian. So this uh, figure reports the average carbon intensity uh, over time from 2005 to 2018. So you can see that the blue line indicates the uh, in scope one carbon intensity for an average firm. And uh, you can see a sharp drop around 2015. And uh, that may be because of Paris Agreement. So firm can cut their carbon scope one emission. But uh, if you look at the, the dotted uh, green line or the dashed uh, red line, these are the average carbon intensity for scope two and scope three. And here we don't see much change. 
and uh, so um, so it suggests that the firm maybe there are some recent study look at whether firm can export or outsource their carbon emission to other country like emerging country with less stringent regulation on carbon emission. And maybe that's what happening here. Firm can outsource their carbon emission, especially from developed country can outsource their carbon emission to emerging country. And that can directly reduce their scope of emission. But actually that does not necessarily address the global warming issue because ultimately it's the cumulative amount of uh, carbon dioxide that uh, affect the global warming. So if it's just a shift of the emission from some country to other country, then it's uh, actually no use, not useful to the to addressing the climate change issue. Um, yeah, so that's uh, what I can infer from this uh, chart. So uh, carbon intensity, of course, varies by industry. Um, so if we look at uh, focus on scope core emission, we can see that the three most carbon intensive industries are utility, energy, and the chemical. So this is not very surprising. Uh, these are indeed a very carbon intensive uh, industry and the sectors. Um, so what this suggests that when we do the empirical analysis, data when we sort firms into or sort bonds into portfolio based on their carbon emission, we need to take into account this uh, industry heterogeneity. So if we simply sort based on the raw carbon intensity, then most of the utility company will end up in the portfolio with the highest carbon intensity. And then what the, the long short portfolio capture is just an uh, industry effect, not truly a carbon intensity, carbon risk effect. So uh, to address this issue, we will perform the portfolio analysis within each of the pharma French 12 sector. So we are essentially choosing using a, a best in class approach. So we look at the firms that uh, have lowest carbon intensity compared to the firms with the highest carbon intensity within the same industry. And so potentially that can remove any confounding effect from industry effect. And then we average the portfolio across different industry. So the quinta one portfolio, the lowest carbon intensity portfolio will actually balance all the different industries. They just select the firms with the lowest carbon intensity uh, within all these uh, individual sectors. And in this way, our portfolio will be uh, not uh, tilted toward a particular industry. So it will be less confounded by this industry effect. Frank, there's, our, a, there's a hand up. Yes, uh, yes. Juan, please, please go ahead and ask. Okay, uh, can I ask um, one uh, very quick question? Like, because I also uh, classify uh, firms, uh, capital risk uh, performance based on uh, criteria from S&P. For example, like S&P, they also mentioned there's five uh, industry, uh, utilities, energies, material, industrials, and consumers. So I'm not sure if uh, your uh, carbon emission intensities uh, classifications are the same or maybe contrast with um, the criteria to classify industry of um, more carbon risk of the firm. And also like, uh, because like, uh, also like days like nine uh, GICS industry, they also have like more carbon risk so I'm just curious whether they, your your classification based on um, the the tons of CO two over uh, like um, firm revenue uh, revenues like and also like is it overlapping or maybe contrasting or why I'm just curious. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, you are saying whether first whether our sector definition correspond to the the sectors used by the like SMP or other uh, practitioners. So, um, so for this question, we actually use the pharma French 12 sector classification. So I believe it's, uh, it's closer than the GICS or other industry classification used by the practitioners. So the reason we choose the pharma French 12 industry classification is because um, our sample is actually small to begin with. If you look at the number of firms matched with the corporate bond data, uh, 
there are only 1,000, uh, around 1,000 unique firm. And each period, maybe much less than 1,000, maybe only a couple hundred uh, firms. So um, we can only do 12 pharma, pharma French 12 classification. If we do final industry, industry classification, then with each industry, the number of firm will be even small, uh, even smaller. So that will actually lose the meaning of the classification. So that's why uh, we choose a broader definition of industry. Uh, uh, so okay. That's the main reason. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? So, as I mentioned, we will do the portfolio analysis within each industry, and uh, essentially we are using a best-in-class approach, um, and then we will see how the portfolio return varies with the uh, carbon intensity. And in this way, we can remove the confounding effect from the from the industry. And our uh, factors to adjust for the benchmark portfolio return for corporate bonds are uh, mainly stock market five factor stock market uh, model and also four factor bond market factor model. So the four factor bond model is a, the, actually the state of art uh, bond factor model uh, proposed by Bai Bali and Wen, uh, Wen, Chen Wen is, my, uh, is the cause of this paper. So they propose a four factor model, including the aggregate bond market factor, a downside risk factor, a credit risk factor and a liquidity risk factor can jointly explain the cross-section of corporate bond return well, much better than other uh, leading uh, factor models. So we will mainly use their model because it represents uh, the most uh, powerful model to explain the cross-section of corporate bond return. And we'll also use stock market because uh, there are some integration, I could argue there should be some integration between equity and the bond market. And we'll also use both the stock market and the bond market factor to adjust the risk exposure. So, um, so we first start, start with the portfolio sorting. So at, uh, standard, as a standard in the asset pricing and pre-asset pricing research, we form portfolio at end of June each year based on the carbon emission data available at uh, physical year T minus one. So in this way, we can avoid any look ahead bias in the portfolio construction process. As I mentioned, we will form portfolio within each of the pharma French toy industry, because otherwise, uh, if we sort on the raw carbon intensity, then it will have a strong industry clustering. Uh, and we want to avoid this uh, industry, the portfolio tilted toward one industry. And then we, calc we aggregate the other portfolio across all different industries so that the other portfolios uh, have representation from all different industries. And then we calculate the value which the portfolio return from July of EAT to June of EAT plus one. Um, so this is the, main re the first main results of our paper. So we put the other corporate bond into five quintile. So the lowest quintile represent bond issued by firm with lowest carbon intensity. And the highest quintile are the bond issued by firm with the highest carbon intensity. So we can see that as we move from the lowest quintile to the highest quintile, um, the average carbon intensity by construction uh, monotonically increase. How will you find that the average return of the corporate bond issued by this firm uh, actually decrease? Um, and uh, if we adjust uh, the average return by stock market factor, bond market factor, we also see that uh, uh, the bonds issued by high carbon intensity firm actually have lower return and alpha compared to the bond issued by high carbon intensity firm. So if we look at the long short portfolio, the high minus low uh, portfolio is always significantly negative, even after adjusting for the stock market and the bond market factor. And uh, in terms of economic magnitude, the monthly alpha, uh, four factor bond alpha for the long short portfolio is around uh, 16 basis point. So around uh, 3% per year. So um, given this is a bond market, the average expiry return is not high to begin with. This 3% uh, return spread of this long short portfolio is already considered the economically uh, significant effects. So that's uh, uh, our first main results. We find that the high carbon intensity bonds 
actually earn lower return and alpha than bonds issued by low carbon intensity firm. So uh, one immediate question is that whether this uh, negative alpha of this high minus low portfolio can be explained by other uh, systematic risk factors. Um, so we look at uh, how the average risk uh, characteristics differs across the five portfolio. So we, if you look at the, again, as we move from the lowest quintile to the highest quintile, the average bond market beta actually increase, so indicating higher systematic uh, uh, risk. And also the downside risk of this uh, portfolio monotonic increase from the lowest uh, to highest uh, carbon intensity portfolio. And also the average illiquidity also increase. So the liquidity is also lower for the high carbon intensity bonds. And the credit rating is also lower. So we convert the numerical, we we'll convert the, the credit rating into a numerical score and the high number indicates uh, actually lower credit rating. So you can see that uh, high minus low uh, portfolio has a positive rating difference, suggests that the highest uh, quintile actually have a lower credit rating than the lowest quintile. And we also, uh, in this, in unreported results, we also look at the, the profitability of these uh, carbon intensity sorted portfolio. We find the high CEI firms actually less profitable than firms with low carbon intensity. So it seems that the risk cannot explain the low carbon alpha. Um, and uh, we also look at whether in a multivariate regression framework, whether the carbon intensity is explained by a way is absorbed by other bond characteristics or firm characteristics. So we run far the best regression using carbon intensity of the firm to predict the future bond return. And we control for uh, both bond characteristics and also the bond risk exposure to other systematic risk factor. So um, this is the final mass regression results. We can see that no matter whether we, we control for the bond characteristics or the bond risk factors or not, the coefficient on the carbon intensity is always negative and significant. Um, so this suggests that the predictive power of carbon intensity cannot be fully explained by uh, other bond characteristics or bond exposure to other risk factors. So we also conduct a, a set of robustness tests for this bond return probability. And uh, uh, we find the result is actually quite robust. So for example, we look at uh, scope one emission or scope one, scope two emission combined we still find the negative return, their negative return probability based on the carbon intensity. Uh, and we also exclude the firms in the three most carbon intensive industry. And we find that uh, the results actually hold, even if we exclude the, the most carbon intensive industry, suggests that uh, the result is not actually concentrated within the most carbon intensive industry. And uh, we also exclude the global financial crisis period and find that uh, the results is still robust. And we also use alternative factor model to adjust the risk exposure. And we find a significant uh, alpha using all different type of uh, factor model proposed by the recent uh, asset pricing studies. And then we look at uh, whether there is uh, some type of integration in the equity market with the bond market. So we check whether there is indeed a low carbon alpha in the stock market. So this is our uh, results. So um, the results actually uh, varies a little bit depending on whether we look at uh, stocks that issue, that issue corporate bond or stocks, all stocks, including those firms do not issue any corporate bond. So this result is based on, this first result is based on the stock marks, the firms that issuing corporate bond so it's a smaller sample than the usual CRISP sample. So we can see that within this uh, sample, which is similar as uh, the bond market, the, there is indeed a low carbon alpha in the stock market. So this uh, high minus low portfolio is also negative significant. And with a monthly uh, five fact alpha around uh, 50 basis points, so around 6% per year. So this is uh, consistent with the uh, idea that there's some type of integration 
sort of integration between equity and bond market. Um, when we look at the other stocks, including the firms that do not issue corporate bonds, we still find that negative return probability or carbon intensity for stock market. Although the, st the statistical and the economic significance is weaker here. So the alpha is around 20 basis points. Um, so this is the uh, evidence from the stock market, which is uh, actually consistent with the uh, evidence from the bond market. So um, the last part of this paper try to explain why there is a low carbon alpha in the data, given our original hypothesis is a carbon risk premium hypothesis. So as I mentioned in the introduction, there are two recent theoretical papers that can potentially explain the low carbon alpha. The first is simply an investor preference story. So if more and more investors start to divest from the fossil fuel and the high carbon intensity industry, and the more investors adopt ESG investing approach and the uh, um, investor flow, invest money flows into green assets, that can lead to uh, price pressure for the green assets. And that can lead to a high real return for green assets in a period when this uh, invest preference for green assets strengthen unexpectedly over the sample period. And this seemed to be the case, seemed to be a plausible story uh, to explain the low carbon alpha, because in our sample period, there's indeed a significantly increasing number of investors start to commit to divest from fossil fuel industry. And we know that the trend to adopt ESG investing is also becoming more and more uh, pervasive across the entire asset management industry. So this seems to be a plausible story that can potentially extend the low carbon alpha. So we test this uh, hypothesis uh, using institutional holding of corporate bond. So we get the holding of corporate bond by institutional investor from uh, Refinitiv Emax database. So this data is uh, similar to the 13F. Uh, it contains a coverage of a fixed income holding by US institutional investor, mainly insurance company and mutual funds. And uh, uh, we compute a measure called the institution ownership which is amount of the hold by institutional investment demand by the amount of bond outstanding. And our main variable of interest is the change of institutional ownership uh, in the year after we observe the carbon intensity. So if institutional invest indeed works the talk and uh, divest from the carbon intensive assets, then we should uh, expect to find a significant negative coefficient for the uh, return for the predictability of carbon intensity for the future change in the institution ownership. Um, so this is the first, uh, the first test to check whether in institutions indeed reduce their holdings of high carbon intensity bonds. Um, however, this is not uh, um, able to fully address the question whether the changes in the institutional ownership can fully explain the low carbon alpha. So to test whether the shift in the institutional demand can explain away the return probability of, of the low carbon intensity, we need to include the change of institutional ownership uh, in the pharma mass regression. So we will include the uh, future change of institutional ownership, which is measured in the same period as the return and see whether this change of institutional ownership can drive away the return probability of carbon intensity. So if the carbon intensity predict future return simply or only because it uh, predict a future change in the institutional ownership. So once we control for the changes, the actual change in the institutional ownership, the return probability of carbon intensity should become insignificant. So that's the second test that we look at. So, um, so this is the test first the results on the relation between carbon intensity and the future change in the institution ownership. So we say that the coefficient on carbon intensity is indeed uh, negative and uh, highly significant, suggests that uh, indeed the institution investors, they collectively reduce their holding of bonds issued by carbon intensity firm. So uh, it seems that uh, institution investors uh, overall, they work, their, work the talk and uh, divest from uh, brown assets. Um, the second uh, 
results look at whether the changes in the instrument ownership can explain away the return probability of carbon intensity for future boundary return. So we control for the, the future change of instrument ownership, which is measured in the same period as uh, the boundary return. And we see that the coefficient of carbon intensity is actually still significant and negative. Um, the magnitude is reduced by around, by around 25%. However, it's still negative and still significant. So it suggests that the change of institute ownership cannot fully explain the low carb alpha effect in the data. So that's uh, our test for the first hypothesis, which is the investor demand change or invest preference change. Our second uh, hypothesis, so is proposed by uh, Patterson and his co-author. They argue that carbon intensity can maybe able to predict the future firm fundamental cash flow. And uh, if the market underwear to this predictability of firm fundamentals, then we will find a significant low carbon alpha in the data. So we test this uh, invest underreaction hypothesis using a uh, two main set of analysis. So first is we look at uh, if the underreaction story is true, then the underreaction should be more likely to happen uh, when the bond face high information asymmetry. And when the uh, investor pay less attention to climate change issues uh, in, uh, in certain periods. So uh, we argue that the bonds with high, uh, with bond with low credit rating, the non-investment grade bonds, bonds with longer maturity, and the bonds with lower liquidity, and higher big spread, they are likely to suffer more from information asymmetry. And if invest on the reaction is uh, the story, then the return probability should be stronger among uh, such bonds. So indeed, we find that the low carbon alpha is more pronounced among non-investment grade bonds. So among non-investment bonds, the long short portfolio is uh, almost uh, two times or three times larger than the long short portfolio in the investment grade bonds. And uh, similarly, in the less liquid bonds, the long short portfolio, the low carbon alpha is much larger than the than low carbon alpha for bonds with high liquidity. And uh, we can also explore the variation over time. So we use a Google search of topic, the topics of climate change or global warming as a measure of invest attention to climate change issues. And we also use a Paris Agreement as a cutoff point to identify when investors, investors start to pay more attention to climate change issues. And our, our prediction under the invest underwriting hypothesis is that when investors pay less attention to climate change issues, the return probability of carbon intensity for bond return will be much larger. And this is indeed what we find. So for example, we use a Google search volume index to identify invest attention and we classify uh, over the whole sample into two periods. One is when invest attention increase, another is when invest attention decrease. We find that the low carbon alpha uh, is, uh, is almost entirely concentrated in the period when invest attention to climate change are reduced. And we also look at the, the return performance in the pre and the post Paris Agreement period. And our hypothesis predicts that the return effects should be much stronger before Paris Agreement, when investors are less concerned about uh, climate transition risk. And that's indeed what we find. We find that the low carbon alpha is an almost entirely concentrated in the period before Paris Agreement. Well, the return, the low carbon alpha become uh, close to zero in the post Paris Agreement period. Um, a more direct test of the invest on the ration hypothesis is to look at whether carbon intensity indeed can predict the firm's future fundamental news or cash flow news. So we use three proxy for firm cash flow news. Uh, one is a standardized unexpected earnings, SUE. Another is a uh, standardized unexpected revenue growth. And the third measure is the market-based measure, which is a return around earnings announcement. So using all three measures, we find that uh, carbon intensity can, high carbon intensity firm experience a lower cash flow news in the future. So the coefficient on the carbon intensity is always significantly negative 
no matter which fundamental or cash flow news variable we look at. So high carbon intensity firm indeed experience um, lower earnings surprise, lower revenue growth, and uh, lower earnings loss return in the future. Um, so that's consistent with the invest on the ration hypothesis. So this is a result from the carbon intensity to firm fundamental to more closely linked to the bond return. We also need to examine whether carbon intensity, the predictability of carbon intensity for firm fundamental also affect the firm's uh, credit uh, rating and credit worthiness. So the idea is that if carbon intensity is a leading indicator of firm's future fundamental, that fundamental may also affect the firm's credit worthiness, and that can lead to uh, changes in the bond return. So uh, for example, if car firms with high carbon intensity, they experience uh, poor fundamental growth in the future, that can, may lead to a deteriorating credit worthiness and downgraded uh, bond downgraded by the credit rating agency. And that can lead to a lower real life return for the bond issued by high carbon intensity firm. So this is how uh, the changes or the predictability of carbon intensity for firm fundamental can lead to the predictability of for bond return. So we use two proxies for firm credit worthiness. One is a bond level credit rating. Another is a, a O score, which is a measure of financial distress. A high O score measures a, a higher probability of financial distress. And again, we use, we see, we examine whether carbon intensity are able to predict the uh, lower credit rating of the firm in the future. So this is a predictability of carbon intensity for firm credit worthiness. So we can see that the high carbon intensity indeed predict a, a lower credit rating and also higher O score for the firm in the future. And so this is consistent with the um, best on the ration hypothesis. And uh, um, so there's still question asking why firms' calm intensity should be able to predict the firm's fundamental cash flow. What is the exact channel that uh, can uh, then generate such a predictability? So we believe that uh, the reason could be because uh, firm's environmental profile are quite persistent. And they, the, this firm with high carbon intensity in an industry may run more less efficiently or they have poor environmental policy in, uh, in their firm. And uh, this can lead to more environmental incidents in the future. And if there is, there is indeed a relation between carbon intensity and the environmental incidents, uh, that can lead to, for example, lost uh, customer revenue or uh, more fines by the regulators. And this can directly affect the firm's future cash flow and the fundamental. So this channel should be that the carbon intensity is able to predict the firm's environmental risk and the environmental incidents in the future. So to test this idea, we gather the data for firms uh, ESG incidents from the rep risk. So rep risk is a company that provides uh, data on firms ESG incidents. And uh, the data compared to other ESG metrics the rep risk uh, measure of ES incidents is uh, less subjective and less prone to firm manipulation because actually they get the data from external source, not from the firm's own reports. So we capture firm environmental incidents using the change in the rep risk index. And we also make sure that the environmental issues are the main reason why the ESG incidents in ESG index increase. So we require that the percentage of environmental issues due to compute the reference index is more than uh, 50%. So uh, then we look at whether carbon intensity of a firm can predict increased incidence of uh, environmental issues in the future. So this is uh, our results. So we found that indeed uh, firms with high carbon intensity uh, experience much more frequent environmental incidents in the future. So in fact, uh, the top quintile carbon intensity firm experienced 50% more environmental incidents than the firms with lowest environment, lowest carbon intensity over the following year. And this may be a re link 
maybe the reason why the coming intensity is able to predict the firm's future fundamental and the cash flow news. Once the incident, environment incident is realized, the firm may have uh, reduced the uh, sales revenue from its customer or experience more government punishment or fines, and that can lead to a lower cash flow and a fundamental and a poor fundamental for firm with high carbon intensity. Right. And, uh, yes. Just quickly, uh, we're approaching in roughly 10 minutes, the end of the official end of the session. People are welcome yes. to stay longer, but you could wrap up so we still have some Q&A time. That would be great. Yes, sure. So, uh, so let me quickly conclude. So in this paper, we look at whether there is a carbon risk premium in the corporate bond market. And we find evidence actually contrary to the carbon risk premium hypothesis. So specifically, we find bonds issued by firm with high carbon intensity and significantly lower future returns. And uh, um, this low carbon alpha effect seem to be most consistent with the invest under ration hypothesis because we find the carbon intensity predict firms' future cash flow news, uh, deteriorating credit worthiness, and also more environmental incidents. And uh, we argue that this inefficient uh, pricing of carbon risk on the reaction to carbon risk in the bond market has important implication for financial stability and also for climate mitigation policies. So, uh, so that's actually uh, all what I have to cover uh, for today's seminar. And I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to any comments and questions. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so the floor is open to the audience. Do you have any questions for Frank or comments? I, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I just, just one, one short questions. I know that you uh, evaluates two activities. One is utilities, and the other one is chemical. How about transportations? I know that transportation, especially air transportations, will not be possible to be reduced, and we have a a, a way out for uh, transfer carbon pricing or, or something like that. And then, would there be any? Uh, a thought in the future about if the, the bond is coming from airline industry. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your question. So, um, so in fact, we what we look at is uh, the average effect across all industry. Um, we did not specifically look at uh, the pricing of the carbon risk in any particular industry. Um, so I don't have a direct answer to your question, whether there is a significant uh, low carbon alpha in the transportation industry or not. But I could check this result later on. Uh, one issue for this uh, industry by industry analysis, for our sample is that the sample is already very small. We only have 1,000 firms to begin with. And if we divide it uh, across the 12 or 10 industry, then each industry will unable to be, have sufficient number of firms to allow us to sort into a well diversified portfolio. Um, so the estimates could be quite noisy. But what we check, what we did look at is the following. We removed the three most carbon intensive industries, including utility, chemical, and energy. We find excluding the three most carbon intensive industries, we can still find a low carbon alpha effect. So it suggests that the low carbon alpha is not, fully, is not only driven by the three, the most carbon intensive industry. Um, but uh, uh, for your question, specific question of whether there is a low carbon alpha or carbon pricing effect in the any specific industry, uh, we currently we do, I don't have a good answer for you, but we will definitely check this. Um, but my my concern is that the estimates will be very noisy because the number of firms within each of the industry is uh, quite small. Yeah. yeah I hope you. I hope I also I'll answer your question. I will, we will check the data and see uh, whether there is a, any particular industry has a low carbon alpha or carbon pricing effect. Yeah, I also see, uh, Anna, you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentation very much. I, I have a question concerning the um, uh, carbon intensity measure. 
Yes. Um, so my concern or my question would be, um, do you think there is another um, a metric that could be used uh, to divide the carbon uh, emissions by? So basically you're using um, revenues, but it, could it be possible to use I don't know, profits or enterprise value. So my concern is basically that um, the companies, they, well, usually get bigger uh, in, with the time, right? So uh, how possible is that the carbon intensity measure basically gets, uh, well, smaller, not because the companies are intentionally um, reducing their uh, carbon emissions, but because they're growing and they get more revenues. Yeah, yes, that's a very good question. So, uh, uh, indeed, our measure of carbon intensity is uh, to scale the level of carbon emission of the firm by revenue. Um, so, uh, actually, we had, we already did some uh, sensitivity analysis by replacing the revenue with, uh, for example, firms' total assets and also uh, market cap. So these are alternative, two alternative measure of firm size. And we find the results actually robust. Uh, as long as we scale the level of CO2 emission by some measure of firm size, it does not matter which size measure we actually use, the results will hold. So what the results does not actually hold is we use the level, the raw level of carbon emission. Then there is no such a low carbon alpha effect. But as I um, argued uh, and mentioned here, we believe that we, for when the purpose of the study is to relate the carbon intensity or carbon emission to asset return, uh, we should use some type of skilled version of carbon emission. Otherwise, it's not comparable across the different firm and also uh, it's mechanically correlated with the firm size. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I also see a question from. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Frank. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question or a comment regarding the this uh, underreaction story. So uh, I'm wondering, is it possible also to to look at the to check the time to maturity of the bonds? Uh, so uh, so if uh, so if the hypothesis is correct because there's underreaction, uh, then you would uh, probably would observe lower. Uh, this low carbon alpha when uh, when the bond is closer to the uh, to its maturity because it's clear about future cash flow and so on. Yes, yes, that's actually so, a very yeah that's a good question and uh, uh, we actually uh, we actually checked that and uh, I didn't have time to cover it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you raised uh, this uh, this dimension of the the test. So what we look at indeed we look at. Uh, whether results differ across bond with different maturity. And here is the results. You can see that uh, indeed we find a stronger low carbon alpha in the bonds with higher maturity. We can see that with our cutoff point is six year, which is the median maturity in our sample. So the alpha is a 23 basis point in the longer maturity bond versus the 13 basis point in the, the short maturity bond. And as you mentioned, there are the reason could be that the short maturity bond, they are they do not actually depend too much on the firm's fundamental value because they are by contract they should be able to more likely to pay off invest no matter what the firm's long term horizon fundamental could be. Um, while the long time long maturity bonds more depend more on firm's fundamental because they have more certainty about whether the the coupons and the principal can indeed be paid back by the firm. So that's why the result is stronger here. Yeah. yeah, this is consistent with your conjecture. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, well, I'll conclude at this point the official part of the seminar because we're right at quarter past five. That doesn't mean you have to leave. Uh, I will just uh, stop the recording now. Um, and, and basically, you're, you're free to go. Um, but, you know, if, if you'd like to discuss more, by all means, stay here. I, for instance, have a question I want to ask. Um, but for now, 
Thank you very much, Frank, for being with us here in Zurich. Uh, great talk, uh, round of applause. Uh, um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining in today.